we started a new series last week, didn't we? Um, all about discipline. And um, I've got to tell you, when you start thinking about speaking on a subject like discipline, you kind of get palpitations um, as a speaker because it's one of them subjects that can be really difficult to communicate well because it can be one of the things where people just, you hear the word discipline and you think, all oh, right. You're going to be telling me all the stuff I should be doing, like give me a shoulda, coulda, woulda list. And um, that's not our heart, actually, ever um, at Grace Church. It's never really about shoulda. It's always about get to. And so um, discipline is not, it's not meant to be a negative thing. It's actually meant to be a really positive thing for our lives. And so um, we, we, we call this series God Disciplines. Um, which is not an amazingly catchy title for a series, but the last series was called uh, God Wise. Um, In that series, we looked at how um, we don't want to just be streetwise, we want to be God-wise, because there's godly wisdom for us to have, and that's the wisdom we want to lean into. Sometimes that's not wisdom that the world would recognize, but we recognize as Christians that God has wisdom and that living God's way is better. That his ways are better, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, and ultimately we want to live that way and lean into God's wisdom for our lives. And I gave you um, like a, a, a statement last time in the last series about wisdom that um, wisdom is, I'm going to try and get this right now because I've not prepped this bit, I'll just make it up as I go along. Wisdom is knowing the right thing to do. Knowing the right thing to do. And then last week, I gave you a statement for this series that that discipline actually is lifting the level you're living at to match your level of wisdom. So it's okay to know the right thing to do, but by living a disciplined life, we actually do the right things. And so um, we all tend to know what we should be doing, right? We all know. We all know we shouldn't be eating loads of chocolate cake. But we do, don't we? We all know Christmas is around the corner and we're going to all gain like a stone over Christmas. We know we, but, but the point I'm making is this. Discipline is actually raising your game, raising your level of action to match your wisdom. And uh, it's a powerful place to live in that. I also gave you this statement as well, which is kind of like an anchoring statement for this series. And that's this. My today is better because of yesterday's discipline. And my tomorrow will be better because of today's discipline. And that is the heart of this series, that you can make a difference to your life, to you. And we've talked a lot in this church about loving each other and doing things for each other. This series is about you. This series and last series is about you. You live in different you live in better and you have the power to make your tomorrow better by leaning in to discipline so uh, lots of positive feedback from last from last week which is great you know james told me he lost a stone a day stone in a day it's amazing um akosh has been going to the gym every single day told me absolutely six to oh six to seven days a week he's in the gym uh, we just call him Rocky from now on. <laughs> Might as well. Um, but I gave you some examples from my own life of how I've been leaning into God's been speaking to me personally about this. And so that's why I wanted to bring this to you as a church. Um, and so I changed, made a few changes in my life. One of them, for example, was getting up earlier. Just always struggled for years about getting up early. And I've just managed to, to, to lock in a healthy bedtime and lock in an early start to the day and it's, it's kind of transformed a lot of my life and and as I was talking about this a lot of it's practical stuff you know I, I gave an illustration about the gym and I said um, that you know sometimes we can get like look at the the task like get, I, get, I get up at quarter past five in the morning now and I, I can remember thinking getting to half past five in the morning that's a big thing for me it was a massive jump but actually you know if you go to the gym you know you don't stop going because you can't bench 100 kilograms. Like if you can only bench 20, you bench 20. And if you bench 20 consistently, 
your life will change, your body will change, you know, and you'll be able to develop and grow. And so, you know, just because something is difficult doesn't mean that we necessarily shy away from it. Um, if we start making steps towards it, then we will get to our goal eventually. And I said that throughout this whole process, for me, God spoke to me um, quite, quite powerfully and asked me the question, what disciplines are you going to bring in for your spiritual life? Because I was all hyped up. I was talking to God and saying, God, oh, I'm, I just feel like, you know, things have changed for me in the gym and I'm getting up early and I was kind of like, I was encouraged. And God was like, oh, great, I'm so pleased for you, Luke. But the Bible says, doesn't it, that physical training is of some value, but spiritual discipline, spiritual training is of value not just for this life, but for the life to come. And I was like challenged by God, you know what, I need to now lean in into some spiritual disciplines. So, last week we looked at the inward disciplines. Um, that was meditation, it was prayer, it was fasting, and it was study. And so, if you missed last week, I want to encourage you to get along. Uh, to get along, you can't go back in time. I want to encourage you to get online and look at last week's teachings so that it catches you up. Today's series, today's series, today's uh, talk is going to be about the outward disciplines in a message that I've called Better Out. Because you've all had a doctor at some point say to us, it's better out than... Yeah. Right. So, so we're going to focus on the outward disciplines today. Okay. Um, so the first outward discipline is simplicity. Simplicity. Uh, Matthew 6, verse 33. It says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Simplicity. Keeping life simple. Isn't, it, isn't life easier when it's simple? You ever had someone explain something to you, and they make it way more complicated than it needed to be? I just overthink it, you know, <coughs> Paula. Um, some people just make things really complicated, really difficult. Um, but simplicity um, is about stripping all that back in your life. Um, it speaks into things like, you know, not wanting stuff that we don't need. Um, not just being, like, consumed with comparison and envy, but being grateful and happy for what you've got. It's like not hold on to stuff and being stingy because you want to collect stuff like money and actually being generous and being free to be able to, to help people out. It's about making it about what's really important. Looking at your life and thinking, what do I need? What's important? And letting the rest go. So what I've tried to do for these, um, these disciplines is I've tried to break down each one into like, what's, what's the benefits of this discipline to your life, and then how can you add it into your life more? So the benefits of simplicity includes peace. Simple is peaceful. It's peaceful. When you don't have loads of things on or lots to think about, simple is peaceful. If you live a life where you just feel like everything's chaos, become more simple. Strip your life back. Bring some simplicity into your life. Simple is clear. Being simple brings clarity to life. It highlights the things that actually are important to you. It's straightforward. It's clear. You know, the, the devil loves confusion. He really does. And he's flipping, having a right go at people these days with confusion. You see? Like, so many people are confused about all sorts of stuff that what used to be quite simple. Yeah. And actually, the devil loves it because if he can keep us confused, he can keep us stuck. We can't move forward. We don't know where to go. We don't know what to do. We don't know how, how our life should look. But actually, simplicity, it brings clarity to our life. Simple is freeing. If you have simplicity, it's freeing because you're not constantly grasping for something that you don't actually need, but you're free from all that. You're free from grasping the next thing. You're free 
from your time being spent on things that you don't need to be spent on. And you're grateful for what you have. You're not grasping everything. It's freeing. Simple also benefits your life because simple is honest. It's really honest. Like it's hard to be deceitful, de- deceitful and to be simple at the same time because you can't hide anything in simple. There's no corners to hide around in simple. It's just simple. It's like what you see is what you get. Wouldn't, you, wouldn't the world be a better place? Wouldn't Christianity be a better place if more Christians, they just what you saw was what you got, right? <laughs> Not that we're all perfect, but you know what I'm saying. It's honest. There's no layers. There's no secrets. And simple as well is purposeful because simple keeps things... Uh, Keeping things simple means that you give yourself fully to something rather than partially to everything. It narrows down what's really important. Luke 16, verse 13. No one can serve two masters. Psalm 131, verses 1 to 2. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haunty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me, but I have calmed and quieted myself. I'm like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I'm content. I'm content. I'm happy with what I've got. I've calmed and I've quieted myself. In a world that's chaotic, anxious, depressed, we get to be a calming, peaceful presence in people's lives. And that is actually more attractive than you think. Don't we sometimes think the attractive thing is to be charismatic, to be passionate? We're, I've even taught that, you know, I've taught about it's important, and it is important to be passionate. But you know what, in this day and age, what's more attractive? Just being someone who's calm. Just being someone who's steady. Just being someone who doesn't get shaken, whose, ca- whose chaos doesn't surround them. But actually, they're just peaceful, quiet people. And you bring something to the world that's sorely lacking. It's attractive. So, simplicity. So, this is how you add simplicity to your life, right? Some practical tools that you can do this. Have a routine. Have a routine. It makes things run smoother, takes the thinking out of it, and it sets you up for the day. Have a routine. Second way to build simplicity into life is don't overcommit. Don't overcommit. There's a reason why that this is a, an outward discipline. It's because actually in order to keep things simple, you have to say no to things, say no to people. And that's actually quite difficult. You have to say no to all the things that bring complexity to your life. That's where the discipline comes in. Um, you know, I, I was taught it in this way when it comes to saying no. I find it quite hard to say no to people. Anyone else find it hard to say no to people? Yeah, you feel guilty. Yeah, we're all the nice people, aren't we? The nice ones who are like, just can't say no to people. This is how I was taught it. It's kind of a helpful way of thinking. Is you're not saying no to somebody. You're saying yes to something else. Uh, and you know, the best way I can describe that is, is um, something me and Leah has had to be religious about. Um, and that's, that's our day off. We have to say no. And, and I feel awful. And I feel bad. I feel when people text me I, and I, I think I'll reply to that tomorrow because it doesn't look urgent. I feel awful. If you're sitting there thinking, is Luke leaving me on unread on purpose? Yes, I am. <laughs> I am. <laughs> but here's the thing, right? I'm, I'm, I, work for, I work, I get paid to work five days of the week. Usually on a Saturday I work as well. Nine times out of ten I work on a Saturday anyway. So one day a week. Now, I find it hard to say no, but this is what I'm saying yes to. I'm saying yes to me, to my well-being. I'm saying yes to my marriage. I'm saying yes to my house being managed well because I can get on with stuff in the house. I'm saying yes to lots of things that I need. So simplicity, yes, it does mean saying no to some things that keep your life uncomplicated, but you're actually saying yes to living a more powerful lifestyle. Don't overcommit. 
say no. And James 5 verse 12 says, Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven, nor by earth, nor anything else, but all you need to say is a simple yes or a no. So decide what it is you need to say yes to. And uh, say no if other things bring complexity into your life. The third thing about keeping things simple is uh, build in margins into your life. You know, I learned this um, in the last couple of years, you know, when it comes again to, to, to work throughout the week, you know, I'll plan. I'm a bit of a planner and I'm a bit of a, I like, I like to have like a, like a schedule, like an order. Um, I, like, I like to have lists, not quite as much as Leah, but I like to have lists. Leah's got a list for everything. And she's old school paper and everything. And I'm like, I, 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 I use an app. Um, but um, I, like to, I like to plan everything out so I know what I'm doing. And if I'm, mainly because I'm forgetful. So if, I, if you tell me something, if I don't write it down, I probably will forget it. And it's not because I don't care. It's just because I'm just, it's made my brain works. Um, so I will, I will write down all the things I've got to do every day. And I, I quickly figured out if I did that for every day of the week and planned the whole thing out, sounds very organized, but then something would happen. Something would happen, and then I'd end up then rushing and like scrambling to get the things done that I planned to get done. And so I quickly learned build margins into your life if you can. Like it's okay to allow a set amount of time in your, in your, in your week that's for nothing. You'll fill it with something, but if, if you leave that in, in there, you will not be scrambling or stressed throughout your week. Build simplicity into life. And also, guess what? If you don't, if you don't fill it with something, if something doesn't come up, guess what? It's just free time. <laughs> Bonus. <laughs> Do something fun. So building margins into your life. And then the last one, to keep your life simple. Um, this is like, I feel like this is like Luke's top 10 list of um, <laughs> tips kind of thing. But Finish, this is a personal thing for me, that's why I'm saying that, it's a personal thing for me. Finish what you start before you start something else. That will keep your life simple. I, so the reason why this is a bit personal to me is, well, it's, it's where I'm inclined anyway. And, and so I can see, I'm not looking at you, but I can see some of you have just whispered stuff to your wives. <laughs> Save that for at home, okay? But I'll give you an illustration from, from, from mine and Leah's relationship. We will start a series on Netflix or on like Amazon Prime or something. And we'll get like six episodes in. And then Leah, when I said to her, should we watch the next episode? She's like, I just don't feel like watching that right now today. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. And then it's like the next day, do you fancy watching the next episode? I don't really feel like that today, no. I'm like, Weeks go by. We must have about 17 different series <laughs> that I'm trying to finish. So I've started saying this to Leah now. I'm going to watch this. You're welcome to join me. <laughs> 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 because I, I want to get it finished. I just can't, I don't like leaving things undone. But listen, it's true, isn't it? When you've got lots of things that you know you've got to finish, it brings chaos and complexity to your life. And actually, if we just work on finishing what we start before we start something else, it just keeps things simple. Is, that, is this helpful? I know this is really practical, I know, um, but I believe, I believe that it's a discipline for our lives. And by keeping things simple, actually, I believe we're honoring God because we are, we're able to prioritize. It makes you think about what is actually important in your life and stripping out all the rest, all the dross. Um, and so we can, by doing that, we can focus more on God. So this is a discipline about being in control of your life. It's about not being battered around by whatever you know, decides that they want a chunk of you. It's also not being caught up with things or, having a, or things having a grip on you that's not healthy for your spirit. This discipline of be, keeping things simple is just plain good for you and your brain will thank you and you'll find space for things, even for God, that you didn't realize you had if you simplify your life. Second discipline outward discipline is solitude solitude aren't you glad you came to church today <laughs> solitude um, solitude is the act of being silent before God it's not a difficult it's not an easy thing to do that is it just being silent I think as a, as a society as a, as a world we've gotten 
really out of the habit of just being silent. Jesus modeled this for us like loads. He always took himself away to, like, to recharge. He would go away and he, I, I'm assuming he would pray, spend time with God, and maybe just maybe meditate, maybe just sit with God though in silence. But he would, he would go away from people to do that. He would be in solitude. But time and time again, we see the, in the Gospels, Jesus did this. There's other verses in the Bible as well that show this. Habakkuk 2, verse 20. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let the earth be silent before him. Isaiah 30, verse 15. In repentance and rest is your salvation, and in quietness and trust is your strength. And one you'll all recognize, Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Solitude, the act of going away by yourself and just being alone with God, being quiet. The benefit of solitude is this. You find more peace in your life. You find more peace. Because you learn as you sit in silence to zone out everything else and lean into that quiet it helps you to tune into God's voice. You'd be surprised if you build time into your life where you go off on your own and you just kind of sit in silence before God, how all of a sudden you start getting thoughts from God. And it's like, is that me or is that God? And you start to get to know God's voice because you're tuning out every other distraction in the world and just honing in on him. So it helps you find, fine tune into God's voice. It, solitude helps you focus off yourself as well. How often do we, in our prayer times with God do we kind of just start by moaning to God about all the stuff that's gone off in our lives? But actually by stopping and just being silent, we allow the focus off ourselves and allow God to actually speak to us. And so it helps us to focus, take the focus off ourselves. And then finally, it's restorative. It's restorative. You can sit in silence before God. Just allowing him to minister to you. You will be restored. Psalm 62 verse 5. Yes, my soul, find rest in God. So this is how you add solitude into your life. Really, really practical, simple ways to do that. Just simply find a space that no one will bother you. For me, at the moment, I, I'm, I'm, as you know, I, I love camping. But you know what I love about it? Being on my own. <laughs> Being on my own is brilliant. You can find that space where it's just the world is just tuned out. Find yourself a space for you that might be a room in your home. For you might be going to a local park and sitting on a bench. Um, be careful with the kids around. You will get labeled a weirdo. Um, <laughs> it may be somewhere else. Find a space where you can be on your own. And just be silent before God. Also, a way to find solitude, add solitude to your life, is have times where you turn your phone off have times where you turn it off again another another way in which me and Leah have had to try and be disciplined for ourselves is when we go on holiday um, and um, you know what we don't want on holiday is getting loads of text messages of, of things that um, that you know Andy and Tess could, could deal with with no problem you know and, uh, and so so what we've done is actually we, we invested and bought a a different SIM card, and when we're going on holiday, that SIM card's on. No one has that number apart from my, apart from our family, Andy and Tez, in case of emergency. We call it the bat phone. <laughs> True story. It's the bat phone. If the bat phone rings, it's an emergency. <laughs> it's life and death. Someone's died. You know. Otherwise, it's dealt with by other people. Um, but you, you know, it's okay to turn your phone off. I remember. A, um, I used to work in, in education in schools. I used to um, uh, cover teacher absence. And this one time, I was uh, supporting in a, in a form tutor, and this girl had been asked by another teacher to, to put a phone away like several times. And then they were cracking down at the time, big policy, and they're like, right, we need, we need you to hand your phone in. You'll get back at the end of the day. This girl could not hand her phone in. And the reason she kept giving was um, because she says, but what if somebody texts me? And I don't reply straight away. They'll think I've fallen out with them. 
And we were all trying to like reason with her, like, you can't wait a couple of hours to reply to your friend. Like, you couldn't wait till break or till lunch. You had to do it in lesson. Honestly, it was like we were chopping her arm off. And, and if, we're not, if we're not careful, we might not even realize this about ourselves, but actually our phones can become, become like a permanent attachment to us. And so if you want to get, find some solitude, turn your phone off for a bit. The world will be fine without you. It'll be okay. <laughs> um, so turn your phone off. Um, and thirdly, just you know, find that space, turn your phone off, and just don't look for anything um, including God, just to fill, to fill the silence, just let the silence minister you. And this discipline is all about stepping out of everything and having some time to reset. And it's amazing how much you will learn about yourself sitting in silence. It's freeing. Okay. Third, is, is this helpful? Yeah. Okay. Good. Has anyone actually put like last week's um, disciplines into practice this week? Has anyone actually started meditating more, praying more? Okay. Homework for this week. <laughs> Two weeks worth. <laughs> okay. So this, this third one you're going to love. Okay. Submission. Oh. Submission. Wow. This is a, this is, diff, this discipline is hard, right? Um, I don't like having to do things the way that others want to. It grinds on me. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> I want to do things my way. Um, but you know what, actually, that grinding on me, actually, it's like, it's bits of me being chiseled off by God. That's why it works, about being in community. That's why the Bible talks about brother is, um, iron sharpens iron, you know. It's about people being together, knocking off. So actually, by me being uncomfortable and having to do something the way someone else wants to, I'm laying down my pride. I'm laying down my fear. Of, I, I, I'm learning to trust in, the, you know, in, in that person or in, in God for the outcome. It's, it's about chiseling bits off of me. You know, pride, selfishness, fear and control. Philippians 2 verses 3 to 4 says, Don't do anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility value others above yourselves, not looking for your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And the Bible talks about at least three different groups of people that we should submit to, according to the Bible. This will be fun. You ready? First one, easy one, God. James 4 verse 7, submit yourselves then to God. Now, we talked about this in the wisdom series, but God's ways are better, actually. They are better. And so when we learn to submit to his ways, our life just aligns and is better for it. Um, you know, when God says some difficult things for us, you know, stuff like in the Bible where it says, um, don't give up the habit of meeting together. Like some, sorry, don't give up meeting together like something in the habit of doing. You know, that's difficult, but it, it means getting to church. Um, not out of religion, but out of obedience to God and out of recognizing that it's good. It's good to be around other people um, just generally, but it's also good to be around people who are saved as well because we support each other in our faith. You know, so... So there's things in the Bible that God talks about for us to live and do that actually, if we do it, we're living in submission to God. We're laying down our own desires and we're saying, God, we're going to do it your way. Okay, the second group of people in our lives that we should submit to is our partners. Those of you who are married, our partners. Um, Ephesians 5, verse 21 to 30 says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. I love how it starts with that because the next verse is the verse that caused everyone to get a back up. Um, it says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you, uh, as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the saviour. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now, if you quote this scripture to your wife, you're dead. Okay, so don't use it like that. But just a bit of a caveat, just a bit, just a bit of a caveat with this scripture. This was written 2,000 years ago in a society where actually that's, what the, that's how society worked. Women were seen as the second person. 
in the relationship and seen as not as significant in the world. Okay, I'm not suggesting that the Bible is wrong or incorrect, but I'm just suggesting it was written 2,000 years ago. And so just bear that in mind because when we get to the next part of the scripture, which again is what we often kind of leave out, we focus on the wives submit bit and we make it like that's the law and there's no other law. No, but actually the next part of that scripture talks to the husbands. And it says, husbands, love your wives. Listen to this. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make a holy cleanse in her by the washing of water through the word and presenting her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And in this way, uh, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own body. And he who loves his wife loves himself. And after all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church for all members of his body. So in other words, he says, it's saying that husbands are to love their, their wives as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He died. He died on a cross. He sacrificed everything. So yes, actually, wives submit to your husbands, but also husbands, lay down everything for your wife. Lay down everything for your wife. Seek to bless her, love her, build her up. Make her the best it can possibly be because that's what Christ is doing to us. He's building us up and making us, it says, uh, holy and cleansing uh, us by what, the washing of water through the word. And he's presenting us to himself as a radiant church. So husbands, do that for your wives. It's about submitting and, and putting each other first, which is why that whole passage starts with verse 21, not one of you submit to the other, but submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Because we lay, we, we lay our lives down for each other. Amen? So um, <clears throat> this is how you can build more submission into your life. Um, also, the Bible talks about submitting to your leaders. Not an easy thing to talk about when you are a leader, because it just sounds as, as if you're just trying to get convince people to do what you want them to do. But that's not the point. The point is it's in the Bible. And like I said last week, if it's in the Bible, we're going to teach it. And so it says in Hebrews 13, verse 17, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. So do this so their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that will be of no benefit to you. Also in 1 Timothy 2, verse 1 to 2, it says, I urge then, first of all, that all petitions, prayer, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and for all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. You know what? I'm like everyone else. I get frustrated with politicians and with rulers and with the, the rules that are put on me. And, and I get frustrated when I think things are unfair. But you know what? When we support our leaders, we've got the best chance of creating a better society. And so as Christians, actually, we're encouraged not just to, not to moan about our leaders, but to do what we can to support them, to pray for them, and to lift them up before God. It's difficult, um, but submission is part of life. And uh, if you can't submit, you will find life difficult. Um, here's what submission brings to your life. It brings humility. You become a more humbly grounded person. It helps you lead better because if you can't follow, then you've got no right asking anyone else to follow you. Um, it helps you to love better because it trains us in putting others before ourselves and thinking of their needs. So here's how you can add more submission into your life. Be more thoughtful of others' needs. And secondly, stop looking for perfect leaders. Just accept a half-decent one. Because we all need grace, including leaders. Okay, number four. The fourth um, uh, discipline, outward discipline, is service. And this is a discipline um, of doing things for other people. Galatians 5 verse 13. You, my dear brothers and sisters, were, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, but rather serve one another humbly in love. 
1 Peter 4 verse 10, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. God's, God asks us to serve each other, not because, because he does other people good, but he does ourselves good when we serve other people. The benefits of service is this, it builds relationships and it shows the love of God in action. You know, become a person who doesn't just talk the talk, but you walk the walk. It shows people God's love. Also, benefit of service is it gives you a purpose in life. It gives you something to throw yourself at. It gives you something you can exercise your passion in. It connects you to a bigger idea for your life. Even if, you just, if it's just serving your neighbours. But in church... You're connected in with a bigger picture, a bigger vision that, you know, we, we together do something that we can't do on our own. We're going to reach more people together than we would do on our own. So it connects you in to a bigger picture, a bigger idea for your life. And it keeps you humble and outward looking. So here's how you can, how you can add service to your life. Have a think and decide what you're passionate about. Have a think and decide what you're passionate about. Recognize a skill and a gift in yourself. You know, we, um, for, when the lights went off earlier on, I went dashing over to see if I could help, and then Ben came over. You know, Ben, ben is a, uh, he, he, owns his, he runs his own business. It's an audio-visual business. And for Ben, Ben obviously joined our church a while back. For him to join our church and say, you know what, I don't want to have anything to do with production I just I want to stand on the door and shake people's hands. He could do that, but actually, his skill, his training, is in audio and visuals. So it makes perfect sense that he's part of the production team. I know James, who heads up the production team, is really grateful for Ben's input in that team. And um, so, but we've all got skills. We've all got gifts. So decide what you're good at. And it's not humble to say I'm not good at anything. Actually, it's disrespectful to God, that. Because God's made you. And he, said you, you, he says you're wonderfully and fearfully made. And he's given you skills and tasks. He's given you spiritual gifts. And he's given you practical, physical gifts. So decide what it is. So decide what you're passionate about. Decide what, what your skills and giftings are. And then find a team. Find a team in church. Or use them to help people outside the church. But just... I would really recommend finding a team in church to be a part of. And, you know, if you're struggling to find what you're good at, then Nadia runs a great grow group called Shape, which is all about finding your fit in things and finding what your giftings are. Although you can't sign up for that now. Maybe, maybe next term, eh? We'll see. Um, can I band up, please? That's my four disciplines for, for today. I want to encourage you. Start putting some of these in practice change your life and the things about discipline is it it won't happen unless you do it what i find about discipline as well is is that um when you first start it it's hard but it gets easier when i first started getting up at half past five i felt like death but now i just get up in fact well like i said to you last week i get, I get up at quarter past five now and to be honest i'm probably going to keep going till about five o'clock and I get up and I feel better for it afterwards. But it was really, really hard to start with. I want to encourage you. Start doing some of these things. Build some prayer into your life. Build some meditation into your life. Build some fasting into your life. Build some study into your life. Build some simplicity into your life. Build some solitude into your life. Build some submission into your life. Build some service into your life. Just bit by bit. And like I said earlier, you haven't got to go in like you would go to a gym and just start on 100 kilograms. You might start on 20. Just start. Start with five minutes of prayer. Start with rather than just losing your temper or arguing your case or whatever, just saying, you know what? I'm going to let my wife have this one. <laughs> I'm gonna, we're going to do it that way. Start building these things into your life. Take your neighbour's bin out. Join a team. Do something. 
Because the quality, I said this last week, the quality of your future is determined by the discipline of today. Hebrews 12 verse 11, no discipline seems pleasant at the time but painful, but later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So no matter what the discipline, it will bear fruit. Whether you want to be more disciplined with your finances, with your time, with your relationships, with your health, with your spirit life, it will build, it will bear fruit. And God has these spiritual disciplines for us that if we lean into them, we will receive spiritual fruit in our lives. I want to remind you as well what I said last week. That David, when he went to face Goliath, he ran towards it. He ran towards the difficult thing. Let's be people that run towards the difficult thing. Not sticking our head in the sand. to our feet Leah's going to finish this series off next week by looking at um, the corporate disciplines so we've, looked at, we've looked at the inner disciplines today we've looked at the outer disciplines Leah's going to finish looking at the corporal, corporal corporate disciplines, in other words the disciplines we get to do together um, so I want to encourage you to lead into that I want to finish by um, just giving you something to think about this week I want to tell you how you can spot an undisciplined person. Are you ready for this? It's really, really easy. Undisciplined people complain. I want to tell you, <laughs> undisciplined people complain. They complain about everything. A disciplined person doesn't complain. They do something about it. And we're going to be people who do stuff about stuff, right? So I want to challenge you this week. If you find yourself complaining, instead think, what am I going to do about this? Start building some discipline into your life. Let's pray. God, we thank you that, Lord, you are a God that, yes, wants to pour stuff out on us and bless us and lavish us, lavish onto us your love and your provision. But I thank you, Lord, that you don't just leave it there Actually, this is a partnership that we get to build and strengthen ourselves and not just that like you're instructing us in your word to build and strengthen ourselves and so for each of us here today Lord I pray for you to just like switch on a light in our minds that there's an opportunity to strengthen ourselves that we take it Lord we pray against any kind of uh, any kind of spirit within us that we seek to complain seek to moan about life and he said Father Lord would you give us a spirit of tenacity a spirit of discipline a spirit of, of get up and go Lord to, to start walking the walk or just talking the talk to so, the people of discipline that built into our lives the things that we know is good for us so we can move forward and see fruit in our lives Lord we're believing for a better tomorrow because of the discipline of today so Lord we give this whole thing up to you all this morning we just pray Lord God to help us